Good afternoon and welcome to the second lecture of the 2011 Food for Thought Luncheon Lecture Series. I'm Mary Kay Cooper, Director of Alumni Relations, and I'm thrilled that so many of you came out to be with us today. If the power goes out while you're eating, don't panic and just eat your cake. <laughs> This series is sponsored by the San Antonio Alumni Chapter and coordinated by the Alumni Office. The series is designed to spotlight Trinity's outstanding faculty. Before we get to today's talk, though, I would like to tell you about an upcoming event. Peter Orzog, who served in the administrations of both President Bush and President Obama, will present an insider's look at the economic scene what's happening in Washington and its effect on business at 7.30 p.m. Thursday, February 24th in Laurie Auditorium. This lecture is part of the Trinity University Distinguished Lecture Series. The lecture is free and open to the public and seating is available on a first come, first seated basis. We're pleased to have several special Trinity people with us today and I want you to be able to recognize them. They are Trinity University President Dennis Alberg, and his wife Penelope Harley, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty Mike Fisher, and his wife Kim. And I'm going to put on the spot back at the buffet, <laughs> Vice President for Fiscal Affairs, Mark Dietrich. <laughs> I want to remind everyone that this program is being recorded so that people all over the world can view or listen to it later. So during the question and answer period, please go to the microphones to ask your questions. Thank you. Our speaker will be introduced by Barbara Witt Howe, class of 1970. Barbara is a director on the San Antonio Alumni Chapter Board and a consultant for the long-term care industry. Barbara. Thank you, Mary Kay, so much. Um, I uh, am so glad to be here today. Uh, as I graduated in 1970, I guess we've heard that. And uh, it was amazing that during that time is when the uh, Urban Studies Department got started. I was um, a student here and I lived on, on campus, et cetera. And uh, when I decided my parents weren't sending me enough money, I decided maybe I should look for work on campus and I became a work study for the Urban Studies Department. And as is usual, uh, as a um, Trinity student, we're exposed to things that we never thought of before. It was a discipline I had never heard of. And I must say that it influenced uh, my life and my career choices forever. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here today. I'm also especially glad to uh, welcome you on part of the San Antonio Alumni Chapter Board and introduce Christine Drennan. Um, Christine is the director of the Urban Studies Program at Trinity. Her interest in the city comes from her own lived experience. She was brought up in Utica and Rochester, New York, and I hope I pronounced that right, uh, during the Civil Rights War of the 60s and the structural adjustments of the 70s. Jobs and people were leaving the industrial Northeast and her family left the inner city for the safety and homogeneity of the suburbs. She has been studying these different landscapes and the processes that produce them ever since, first as a photographer and then as an urban geographer. Dr. Drennan's current research is community-based and involves facilitating a joint effort between the city of San Antonio the San Antonio Independent School District and the San, Antonio, the San Antonio Housing Authority via and private partners to encourage collaborative work toward community development and neighborhood revitalization between these various governing bodies. And as we all know, a very important issue at this particular point in San Antonio's history. The mayor has dubbed this effort the Trinity Project and recently it has served as a foundation for two major collaborative projects in the city both focused on our Near East Side neighborhoods. Christine has researched and published on the formation of the school districts in Bear County and served as an expert witness for MALDEF. 
for the property poor school districts in the latest Robin Hood litigations. West Orange Cove Consolidated ISD et al. versus Shirley Neely, Texas Commissioner of Education et al. In her most recent research, she is attempting to bring the insights of complexity theory to organizing community development and neighborhood revitalization in our inner city neighborhoods. And you might have heard her either referenced or speaking uh, over the news lately concerning the state's reduced funding for education. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christine Drennan. Just two seconds, I have to put this on because I walk when I talk. There. Are we good? We're good. Mm -hmm. We're on? Fabulous. All right. Thank you so much for coming on such a day. And I am from Rochester, New York. So this, um, and moved away very intentionally to get away from this. So, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not happy. Um, but, I'm really, but I'm really honored that so many people are here. And I do want to talk about really what the Urban Studies program is doing. And, and I think the conversations that we're having here at Trinity, but I want to couch it first in conversations that are, that are happening around the United States. Let me see if we get this right. Is that one right? Yeah. Um, about the role of the university, really the role of the university um, in the 21st century. We're having these conversations at Trinity being led by our, the president of our Senate, Diane Graves, who I saw. Um, and we, we have a name for it. We say, where do we go from here? And the faculty and the administration meet, and we have these amazing conversations about what is the role of the university, and really about the very essence of what we're doing. So we're, at, we're at this point now. We're, at, we're asking about higher education and what, and, and what do we do with it? You know, how do we fulfill its academic and its civic missions? What, what is this institution? And we're, and we're thinking very deeply. And we're debating it. And we're defining the mission. And we find the mission itself to be problematic. Right? So what are our academic and civic missions? And if we can't define them and agree, how do we fulfill them? And so this is, this is a little bit of this. Can we agree on all of this? Is our mission intellectual growth? Is it content mastery? Is it job and career placement? Is it making the, the world a better place? And do we have to understand those as separate? Right? And those are conversations we're having. So this is where, this is where I, try to, I try to give a context for what we're doing in the Urban Studies program and some about the conversations that Trinity has. And I look back to the great thinkers because these are not new conversations. We've been having these conversations for over 100 years. But they, 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 they wax and they wane. And right now, they're, right now it's, it's large. And, and 100 years ago, these were big conversations. John Dewey, the great American thinker John Dewey, really called, he asked us to think about a frame of reference, right? In, in, in order to have the same kind of identity conversation that we're doing right now. And he says that unless education has some frame of reference, it's bound to be aimless, lacking a unified objective. The necessity for a frame of reference must be admitted. And there exists in this country such a unified frame, and it's called democracy. And he said, this is what, this is what, we, what, should, what should be our organizing, our structural force, is democracy itself. Not necessarily job training. But let's figure out how to engage our society, not just through voting, but through true, true civic engagement. Um, Chicago's first president echoed Dewey's vision of the, role of, the, of the role of the university when he says, in 1905, the university, I contend, is the prophet of democracy, the agency established by heaven itself to proclaim the principles of democracy. It's the university that fights the battles of democracy. It's war cry being Come, let us reason together. And I love that phrase. So is this still our goal? You know, has our mission changed? If this is early 20th century, but then in the 21st century, has our mission changed? And what is our role? And do we have a role beyond educating the students that are here? Do we have a role as an institution in the community, not just on campus? Those are our big questions. And so looking at our own mission statement, Trinity University is dedicated to creating a superior intellectual environment by providing a supportive and challenging experience wherein students, faculty, and staff can realize the potential of their abilities and engage others 
and their responsibility to others. And so, it, so our mission statement embodies some of the same words that we were, that people were expressing in the early 20th century. And we, and we are, we're revisiting this right now and thinking about it. But if this is our mission, the next question is, how do we get there? How do we do this, right? How do we fulfill it? And if we take it, if we take it seriously and we take it to heart, and we agree that this is who we are and this is our essence, what do we do, right? And so I think looking back again at the great thinkers, John Dewey again says, democracy must begin at home, and its home is the neighborly community. It has to be built on face-to-face -face interactions in which human beings work together cooperatively to solve the problems of life. Another, Daniel Coy Gilman, the first president of Hopkins, says universities should make for less misery among the poor, less ignorance in the schools, less bigotry in the temples, less suffering in the hospitals, less fraud in business, less folly in politics. <laughs>
great diversity in jobs. They're all in medical, they're all in the medical fields, but from the top, top notch research down through all to technicians. So there's like middle class, high class, everything, these fantastic jobs. All come to the east side of San Antonio, right? Where we, where, where's everybody gonna live? That's the big question. It's 12,000 new people. Where will they live? Um, and an interesting question that's being led really by the city right now with some great thinkers. So Brack is right here, right? So the influence here is all through here. Big question on where people are going to live. Where are they going to send their kids to school? What's going to be the impact on our infrastructure, on our schools, on our libraries? All of these interesting questions are being talked about right now. City of San Antonio, right? Mayor Julian Castro, our hero, is elected also, and and really kind of comes into his own in this in the summer of 2009. Um, fantastic thinker. There was actually a lot. There was some, there was energy going on in the city uh, prior to Mayor Castro coming in, and there was a couple of different plans being written. One of which is extremely interesting for the story that I want to tell. There's two plans. One of them was an infill, in, a new infill policy, and the author of the plan is in the room, and I don't see him right now. But, um, but the, with, uh, a new infill policy that was really meant to incentivize development in the inner city. Let's, let, let's try to get away from the sprawl. Let's try to bring a lot of the economic energy back into the inner city. Let's incentivize it by looking at our fee schedule and all of this. Great. The second one was a community development policy, and it said, you know, right now we're, we're really we're really using a shotgun approach to our community development dollars. In terms of neighborhood reinvestment and revitalization, let's, we were really dividing them evenly across 10 city council districts, and they didn't need to be. We really need those dollars more in the inner city. And so three, you know, three community reinvestment zones were designated, one of which was in this near, side, near east side neighborhood, and it's this right here. Where's my pointer? Oh, my pointer's gone. But it's this gray area right here. Again, uh, you know, materializing in my east side neighborhood. There's one on the west side, and there's also one on the south side. So that area was designated to receive a lot of additional funding in terms of mostly infrastructure, but also some social programming. Next one was VIA. VIA has new leadership as well, and they came out with a fantastic new plan built around either electric streetcars or um, light rail. In the 2009, August of 2009, they, had a, they have a huge public charrette, very well attended, and they designated two routes. They're still searching for funding, but they designated two routes. One of them was along East Commerce Street, ultimately going out to the AT&T Center, right, to bring people from the inner city, and ultimately from the west side, what's going to be the multimodal, over into the east side along Commerce Street. 20 to 40 million dollars a mile. Tremendous, tremendous investment. And the potential of it by looking around at other cities is enormous for economic development. We know what happens along those kinds of routes. Business, just excitement and economic energy. So this also is materializing on the east side. Another one, the housing authority, also under new, new uh, leadership, fantastic new leadership at the housing authority. Now they also had plans in place, but she energized those plans, and she energized the people that work for her, I really think. Um, but she's a great new leader. What's happening on the east side especially, though, and I think my pointer is gone. No, there it is. Is this one right here I want to call your attention to? The old Sutton Homes was an old uh, public housing project nestled right up there, right between the, the uh, railroad tracks and I-35. It was raised, R-A-Z-E, um, in late 2009, early, early 2010, to be rebuilt as a, a Hope 6 project. And you've probably seen that, and I've got photos of it in a minute. But this is, so that, that, that old public housing project, was, was, which was homogeneous and poor, sorry, um, was taken down, rebuilt into a Hope 6, which is mixed income. And so a, a portion of it is dedicated to, to, the, to, the, to uh, very low income, all the way through market rate rental units. And so, that, so that's happening at Sutton Homes. It's been rebuilt now and is open at just several phases. So a lot of new families moving into that little corner. And hopefully a fairly diverse group of people as well. Also, you know, all of this, again, materializing on our east side. Finally, the San Antonio Independent School District also comes out with its master plan in 2009. 
And how, how did it materialize on the east side? San Antonio Independent School District is under enormous pressures. They, they, they really reached their maximum uh, in terms of population in the 1970s at about 77,000 kids. They're now down to about 55,000 and really, really had to look deeply in 2009 at the books and say, what are we going to do? I mean, obviously, they're still looking at the books. One of their solution in 2009 was we need to close some of our facilities. And they've been doing this gradually for a long time. But they also looked at our east side and they said, we're going to close. There we go. We're going to close this one right here. And we're going to close this one right here. Two elementary schools. And in addition to that, if you remember, they also said they were going to close Sam Houston High School a little bit further to the east from this, about two miles. So. The interesting thing, all brilliant plans, all done in parallel, right? All done by really, really good, good people who just who know their areas. Every one of them, I, I, you know, is a good friend and I have tremendous respect for. It. If we look at how these line up, though, the alignment issue, we get huge potential investment here. We get reinvestment here, we get a lot of reinvestment and a lot of new people here, and we've got... No, no, no. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. But we've got school closures, right? Is this one? Is this one? But we've got school closures, right? So that, but that was the question, is... How these things, you know, they were done separately. They were done at the city, they were done at the school district, they were done over in the housing authority. Hello, is anybody talking to each other, right? Because look at, when we look in our neighborhoods, when we look in the inner city, how do they align? We've got all these new families that the housing authority is bringing in, but we're closing the school that's right within walking distance. And the, the interesting thing was that from the perspective of the university, and in preparing just for teaching exercises, we were able to see that within each of those government institutions, a lot of the overlap and the non-alignment issues, people didn't realize. And so actually, we were able to, Trinity was able to play this convening role about bringing these thinkers and these policymakers together here on campus and providing a very safe environment in which to really think of the think and illustrate some of the plans that were moving forward, strategic master plans, without any articulation or communication between them. Out of this, and because, and I have great pictures, I promise, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you, know, we had, you know, we had the mayor here, we had Superintendent Duran, we had Executive Director uh, uh, from the, again, from the Housing Authority and from VIA, and we brought them together and had conversations about what does, how do these plans are to materialize? How do they talk to one another and do they? Through that, the, the mayor actually dubbed this whole kind of effort the Trinity Project. And we began, we began meeting. Dr. Albert came, came to us right in the middle of the process and actually was, has been tremendously supportive of that whole process. But I think, it, but what we were able to do is really provide a safe haven where people could come. Highly political people making important decisions were able to come and, and, and talk about things honestly and actually build relationships that, that before had been there but hadn't been as deep as they are today. Part of that was a function of that new leadership. Um, if you remember, there was a tremendous outcry about, around the school closures, tremendous which really tapped into something interesting is that is that we you know we may be an inner city an inner city population or a poor population we're not a, a very literate population but we care deeply about those schools so there was a public energy there that was worth exploring and so what's come out of that is a, a very very collaborative effort over the summer we did pursue some funding opportunities one of which was a, 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 a President Obama campaign promise. President Obama had gone to the Harlem Children's Zone, which is a small area in Harlem where they've, where that's led by one very significant individual to really bring back the schools. But he understands that not only 
do I need to focus on these kids? I need to think about their families. Because it's all those wraparound supportive services that gets a kid through school. And he's done it. He's just this brilliant, brilliant man. President Obama goes to Harlem and gives a campaign speech and says, if I'm elected, I will repeat this effort in 20 cities across the country. The, um, the, the request for proposals went out last May or June. 990 letters of interest. Everybody wanted to do this. The, the, the application process was, was, was so horrendous that they, they ultimately got about 350 proposals from cities around the country Many cities putting in two, including ours. And this little Trinity project, this east, east side neighborhood, got one of these promised neighborhood, neighborhood grants. It's the lead agency is United Way, and Trinity is, Trinity is one, of the, one of the partners in that. It's not, you know, that's, as far as like those kinds of funding opportunities, I'm not sure if that's our job. But the convening, and we're, and we're doing all the research in terms of what's really on the ground. What are the needs? What are the assets? What are the networks in place in that neighborhood? And that's what we're lending to the Promise Neighborhood effort. Brought about, it's, it brought about, brought about $350,000 into the community. But, uh, but what's really significant is the relationships that have been built, including ours. Right now, you know, we're at the table, Trinity's at the table with the mayor and with the superintendent and with the housing authority talking about those issues and how, you know, what is our role? Supportive, yes. Institutional, yes. Educational, yes. Um, okay. A second project that I just want to introduce to you, again, imagine great slides, um, is a... Uh, is a supply and, a supply and demand study that, that we're doing for who? A plethora of affordable housing providers. Now, affordable housing is a really, really tricky industry. Um, you know, the housing authority provides, it's, it provides a, a majority of it, but there's also several different niches in affordable housing that, that, that uh, mostly uh, not-for-profit organizations and corporations actually provide this housing through an incredibly complicated financing system. It's a combination of a lot of different financing, mostly in tax credits. The thing is, again, because of the nature of that industry, a lot of, these, a lot of, a lot of the not-for-profits working with the housing authority don't cooperate that well because often they have to compete for funds. They have to compete for funds, they often have to compete for property. And they're also actually, unfortunately, competing for um, that portion of the population that is responsible, you know, renters in that very, very limited income bracket. So it's a really, really difficult niche to fill. What we did realize, though, through, um, through the SA 2020 process, and through the new mayor, and through the new housing authority, was that this, this not sharing of information wasn't getting us anywhere, right? That we were being quite, or not we, but the, the housing providers were being quite protective and a little bit territorial about this. And how, would, how could we share information, figure out if we're serving, the, it's serving the, that proportion of the population well? And, what they, and so they actually reached out to Trinity again into the Urban Studies program and said, as an apolitical, objective, educational institution, will you do this supply and demand inventory for us? Right? And so it's since then, and that happened right around Thanksgiving, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we've been collecting information from all of the different housing providers and the housing authority on what, you know, what are your assets on the ground and where are they? Right? Where are you investing? What, uh, who are these units for? They're, it's all multifamily. There's very little single family housing. Um, who are they for? Are they filled? What's the demand? And looking at the newest census figures that come out, saying, well, what's our, what's, what does our income distribution look like? Do we have, you know, how many people do we have that are making that little money that can't afford to enter the housing market? And the not-for-profit community is actually helping them in, get into housing. And then, of course, the, the, that very low level with Haven for Hope. So looking at supply, looking at demand, and what we find is there's an interesting geography to this, and that the distribution of housing across the landscape is not even. But it's what it, we tend to put a lot of our affordable and our public housing into the poorer neighborhoods. What, but by doing this, by pulling all the information together, it's allowed us to ask the 
really interesting questions. And the really interesting questions are, do we to continue to do this? Do we to continue to put our poor housing in poor neighborhoods? Or do we want to mix it up a bit? Do we want to put affordable housing, housing for people that are making 50% of the area median income, into some of the wealthier or the middle class neighborhoods? Let's give those kids an opportunity to go to our middle class schools. You know, and the, the thing is that by bringing the information together, it's allowed us to start some of these conversations. Because before it was a mystery. We didn't know where the housing was, and we also didn't know because there's about probably about 10 or 12 different players. We didn't know the distribution of the of, of the whole package. We knew just little bits of it. But this is again a role that Trinity's been able to play in terms of that apolitical, objective, educational institution that's non-threatening. Because we can come in, we'll, we, we can gather data, we can process and analyze the data, and then we can map it and present it back in what I think is a safer environment than any one of those institutions may have been able to provide. The third project that I wanted to tell you about is a student project. And so that's that question about, well, okay, as an institution, we see where, you're, where you know, how Trinity is beginning to enter into the community and making this kind of contribution, but how about the students? Is there a student role? Um, and, uh, and, and this one was, this is extremely significant. And again, it was the mayor. But the mayor, um, the mayor campaigned, he had an interesting campaign if you look at it. And he's, he, is, he came out in the paper just last week, he's saying he's gonna get involved in educational issues. But one of, one of, his, real, one of, one of his concerns has been education, yes, but also how are, our, how are our inner city kids especially spending their time out of school, right? What are they doing after school and what are they doing all summer long? Right? And, this, and, and actually in the education literature, this, is, this has been actually elevated recently to a real priority, knowing that school is not just from eight to three o'clock, and it doesn't just happen in one building. We also, have to, we also have to take care of our young people in the summer, before school, after school, and on vacation. Because these families, especially our inner, inner city families, are under such extreme stress and duress. The mayor actually, last year, last spring, invited me and my student, Charlie Mitchell, stand for a second, please. <laughs> this is Charlie. <laughs> Charlie's in urban studies and philosophy double major who will graduate in May, and he was the team leader on this project. He invited us to, the, to a mayor's institute in Chicago. It was an institute on families, children, families, and youth. And it really was a focus on this out of school time and it was, it was an incredibly interesting forum because it was quite small. They brought in the mayors from, I'm gonna get this wrong, but it was like uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, us, we were there, Memphis, Nashville. Huh? Nashville. Nashville was there, and there was another one. There was another one. <laughs> and, we all, and, and, um, and we presented you know, these different cities at this very small forum when the mayors presented, this is what our city's doing in after school. And this is what our city's doing. Our city actually was, was the most behind in terms of, you know, in terms of trying to coordinate, coordinate all of our resources. We have, as you can see on the slide, um, <laughs> probably 30 different providers of after school, after school activities for our youth. And they run from this amazing leadership training and athletic training and music training all the way down through um, let's stick them all in a room like this and give them balls, right? So we've got, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of forms out there. Some of, some of it really educational with really sophisticated programming. Some of it is kid warehousing after school, you know, and we have to be honest. Um, what this team did, and this is, this, Charlie did this, uh, start, Charlie started last summer, was drafted a survey that went out to every single out-of-school time provider and site coordinator in the city. And it was extensive. How many questions? <coughs> but between 54 and 108 questions. It was coordinated by the San Antonio Area Foundation. They, uh, they gave him the support and they gave him the information that he needed to contact all of these different facilities. The response rate was phenomenal. It was about 65% which is very high for a survey. 
People really did invest in this because the community knows how important it is and because the directive came from the mayor. Right? So this was a student design survey. It was tested, it was vetted by, by some of the leading authorities in the city. So Charlie administered it and then analyzed it and then we used the data in a class just this fall to actually try to map it as well to show some of the, the distribution of these programming across the city. Is it equitable? You know, do we see the distribution of music programs? Is it equitable across the city? And it's not. But again, by being able to show that data back to a crowd like this one of, of people coming from a variety of walks of life and people representing a variety of different <coughs> institutions and say, this is what we're doing. This is what the data says. And I'm not making a value judgment right now, but this is what we're doing. Can we start an interesting conversation? And out of that has come um, a lot of talk, again, led by the Area Foundation to begin to form a 501c3 around the out-of-school out of programming opportunities to try to coordinate resources so that we're not duplicating and to try to, re to probably redistribute resources a little bit more equitably across the city. So these are some of the projects that we're involved in, and I think they do get back to the conversations we're having here on campus about what our mission is, but they get back to those early 20th century conversations about what's the role of the institution. You know, what is our role to our students, but also to our communities? Um, and finally, just you know, finally, because, you know, for a lot of different reasons. <laughs> um, but something, something I tell my students all the time, is that, is that, you know, you're here for four years. And I want you to think of this as a safe place. And, in, you know, we have, we have this lab where my students, they literally sleep there. Um, but, and, and I tell them, you know, here we can laugh, you can cry, you can swear, you can hold hands, you know, just to get through some of this work together because you're in a safe place, right? And if you want to swear at me, you can go right ahead and you want to cry. But it also, if you mess up, it's okay because you're in a safe place. When you get off campus, it's not necessarily safe anymore. You have to be a professional, right? And Charlie will leave here in just a couple minutes and is looking at the, the, the most prestigious research universities for graduate school in the country. Right? And, and it's not as safe, right? It's more, it's competitive, um, and, and, and you know, you're, you're gonna be vying for attention and all of these kinds of things. So while they're here, if we can give them these opportunities to leave campus occasionally and do this kind of work and then come back, right? Come back to the safe place in this safe haven, I think, before we send them out. And that's the, one of the greatest contributions I think we can make. One last thing, I promise. Um, and I tell people this a lot, is that I, I do think, I truly think, that the greatest contribution that Trinity can make to the city of San Antonio is to get our students to stay. I really, really deeply believe that because for every one of our students it stays, it's an enormous economic investment that they will make in our city. And by introducing them to the city, by getting, getting them involved in the city and showing them the deep contributions that they can make, like Charlie made this year with the out of school time programming survey, the 501c3 that will come of that, I'm hoping that they begin to put down roots. And then they won't leave. You know, we won't have that brain drain that in some ways we even contribute to because we give them these great resources and everybody wants them. So, that's us. Thank you. Wait, so, yeah, if anybody's got questions, that would be Yeah. I 
I think we're said housing, which is one of these affordable housing providers, has been building and rehabbing homes right in that area. And it's very interesting. They're a, a small not-for-profit, um, one of the most effective in, in affordable housing. And um, but they're having they're having trouble they're having trouble selling some of those houses. So that's one of the reasons we started that 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 very you know collaborative research project was Merced had said you know I'm building these houses but I don't have people who can afford them. You know so I'm targeting this portion of the population that's probably 70 to 80 percent of the area median income. So these are families making in the 30s. She said nobody can afford them. We have such a need lower down that we're missing it. You know, when we target our, in our housing, we're missing it. So, so I, that, that, that's, they've been very active in that area in terms of new housing and in rehab. And I bet that's what those are. And so there's a concern. What I thought when I saw them was, who's going to teach these people how to keep their mm -hmm. houses up? Mm -hmm. There's, um, through a lot of these um, neighborhood and housing services, which is another one of the housing providers, does tremendous educational programming in terms of financial literacy, but also in just terms of carpentry, plumbing, and electrical work. Um, both in how to interface with professionals to do the work, but also they've got a, sh they've got a workshop at their, at their site, which is down on Steve's on the south side, a workshop right there where they, where they do these, these classes for people who, and, and if you're going to participate in housing neighborhood service housing program, you got to go to class. Um, the, the Housing Authority has got classes now in financial literacy. They've got an amazing move to work program. So they're not doing as much in terms of the upkeep of the structure itself, but in terms of just the person. And so as seeing that their mission goes beyond just sheltering people, but also preparing them right, to participate. So the different housing providers are doing those the literacy classes in a variety of ways. I think they're really responding. Yeah. We're using up a lot of suburban land to build more housing, which means more schools, more utilities, et cetera, et cetera. Are we going to put a new school district out there? How many school districts do we have in San Antonio? What is the priority? To get all these school districts together or to get business in there? We're limited funds. Where do we start? How? Yeah. No, that conversation, there's between, depending on how you count, if you count the school districts that overlap the county borders, there's between 15 to 18 school districts in San Antonio. We are unique in that way. Now, none of the other large cities in Texas, actually none of the large cities in the United States have you know, a school district distribution like we do, as fragmented. It's got, um, it's got a very racist history, to, to be perfectly honest. It's very much tied to race relations in the, in, in the 1940s and 1950s, which is an interesting story in itself. Will we resolve it? Uh, you know, there's a, there, there have been conversations that maybe the school district should share things like purchasing, you know, they should purchase together. We're not moving in that direction, to be perfectly honest. Um, you, know, and, you know, yes, theoretically and intellectually, I think everybody knows that, that we need to do that, but it, politically and socially, we're not. Right? Family histories are still tied, you know, on the social side, family histories are tied to particular school districts. So, you know, just as far as, you know, every as a people will be accepted, but then politically, um, with the different, all these different repetitive administrations, is that, is that conversation going to take place? May, unless it comes from the top, I don't think so. Um, an update on that is Sherry Albright, who's the head of our education department, is trying to organize a meeting on Trinity's campus for the superintendents to discuss the issues because a lot of those same issues have come up through the SA 2020 and just about every citizen thinks that there should be some reduction in the number of school districts because of economies of scale. No one has actually established that we would gain from doing that, but as Christine pointed out earlier, conversations either not taking place or being fragmented. So we're taking the lead from what Christine has done to try and bring the superintendents together, again, behind closed doors, so they can kind of talk to each other and see where we can move ahead. Because the public thinks that this is a huge deal, and 
all of the problems in education will disappear if we reduce the number of schools. <laughs> we need to figure that out. If, it's, if that's not true, then we need to get on to, to all of the other issues. But at the moment, everybody's focusing on that one issue, which may, which may not be the solution. Yeah, the, um, at the, the early 20th century, there were about 65 school districts in Bear County. Oh. You know, um, it's an interesting process to watch as they actually did go through consolidation <coughs> in the 1950s. <laughs> now, maybe it'll take another 50 years, but then we're there. <laughs> yeah, please. You mentioned all the people coming in in the new Brack project. Where are they going? Where do you think they're going to go and live and settle down? Oh, with Brack. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Missed opportunity, I think. You know, I really think. Um, we were. Some of this, because some of this wasn't in sync, right? Brack, uh, okay, for just, just a, for a perfect, you know, the, you know, just that my answer to that question is that I think they're going to go to the northeastern suburbs. Um, and a lot of different polling and things like this, and just really watching. There's a, there's a man who works for the city, his name is Brian James. Who's, you know, he really is over the, over the whole Brack, you know, whatever that project is called. But talking to him, and he brings home, he brings together all of the business owners in the area very, very frequently. The word on the street is they're going to go into the northeastern suburbs. We are, you know, the timing is unfortunate because I think because of the reinvestment zones, and actually you are seated right across from the office of that policy, and that's rich you know, um, it, it Because of those reinvestment zones, I do, I, I do deeply believe that those, those. Neighborhoods like our Near East Side will come back, but we're 10 years from there. You know, the policy policy's in place, but it takes a long time. And the first thing that's got to happen is some economic development. And there's signs, there's little signs of that, but it's going to take time. So the timing wasn't right. Yeah. Hi, I, uh, I sit on the East Side uh, Church Board and have a business. We have really worked that. Oh, and that housing project is called the Historic Gardens, Cherry Street, Alamo Dome. Mm -hmm. I think strip that you're talking about, mm -hmm. so Cherry Street, mm -hmm. and that was built in 1994. So it's been they've been they've been sold and you lived in and used and it's real successful. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a, there's a wonderful city project that's about to start at the um, Frederick project. We're studying it. We're hoping that it's going to go this time. Right. And it's been held. They, because of competing interests, economic interests, and whatnot, but it's it's a very it could be a very huge stimulus to the east side, and so there's some great stuff happening over there, but it's hard to get them done as, because of all of the different interests. And, but it's it's a lot of fun, and it's come a long way. Yeah, really. and that one in particular, um, that the, the, the you know speculation on the Frieder building and. Um, and there was a, a, a woman, who, uh, the new um, executive director, I don't know her title, executive director of SAGE, San Antonio yes. for Growth on the East Side, actually called the other day and she said, you know, if, there, if the Frieder building, that big beautiful building on East Commerce, used to make air conditioners, and actually they just moved very, very recently, um, but it's a fantastic building, and if, if it was converted into office space, she said, what would be the impact? What, you know, I need a figure. She said, because I want to go to city council and really fight for this. What would be the impact? And actually, I have a student who's taking that on as her, her spring thesis project to really try to, let's, let's, work, let's do some surveys here and try to figure out how many lunches is that? You know, can the local business community support it? Or will we see some economic development if that becomes office space? So again, you know, I do think that the, the people in the community are starting to, uh, starting to see the universities Hopefully play that role, that is that role. We just committed $100,000 to study that for a specific purpose, so right. you might want to have a I will. I will. We have time for one last question. Kathy? Yeah, well, if I may take the license first to make a comment. Um, huh? I've lived here all my life, and Trinity is if not the most revered, revered institution of higher learning in the city, it's certainly 
real close. And for many years, it kind of ebbs and flows, but it's been cloistered. And as a person who lives here and loves Trinity very much, I'm very, very glad to see the outreach and the interest in the community and the contribution that uh, uh, Dr. Alberg is making and Penelope and you, and it's exciting. Yeah, to us too. Uh, yeah. The claim is that the largest economic event in the the last hundred years in San Antonio is the relocation of all the medical military in San Antonio and mm -hmm. particularly the activity at Brown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's hard to do it because I tried for a year and a half mm -hmm. but I finally got a small group of people to go over there and had the a doctor, I mean a Colonel Wendy Gar explain what was going on there. Mm -hmm. I will tell you she was very frustrated and said this city doesn't seem to have a clue what we're doing what the impact's going to be, and my question was, did you initiate that group of getting together? If you did, congratulations. <laughs> uh, it's one of the rare times that left hands and right hands got together in the city. And I'm just also curious, why were they not included in that group of people? That, those, a lot of, a lot of that has fallen under Brian James. Um, who again, I think absolutely the world of, and he's been working diligently to pull all of these people together. Um, as far as the military thinking that the city doesn't have a clue, I don't know if that's fair, <laughs> to be honest. The city, it, it's, it's just, it, just that it's local politics, it's local, col our, our political culture is, is difficult, you know, it's, it's difficult for a variety of reasons, it's also changing. Um, and I think those are some of the reasons. It's not that, it's not, I think Mayor Castro, I think Brian James, I think that those departments do have a clue. But trying to get us all to work together, because we never have, um, and, to get, and to get people to par you know, partially understand the implications of this thing and not let it go up to the suburbs. So yeah, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that. You can't give you everything. <laughs> um, but no, we, I mean, we weren't. I'm not asking for you. Yeah, we, 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 we did not convene that. We didn't. Um, and, and so that took some really good people, really good people at the city. There's been frustration on the city side also, though, because they're saying, you know, they're not, this is not going to spark economic development because they're keeping so many of the services and so, so many of the, the economic services, like the grocery stores and the commissaries, or whatever they call them, on base. You know, they said that if you let some of that go, maybe it'll help us with our neighborhoods. And so they've got, they've, they've really bumped into each other on that. And then there's all, always the new Braunfels gate issue, right? Will you please open the gates so that you let, not, not as much us to come on, but people to come off. Because if you look at new Braunfels on the south side, it is just dead. And you know, would you please open that gate? Cars coming onto the base are not your terrorist threat, right? That's <laughs> not where it's coming from. But you know, look at our businesses. The business infrastructure right there is just dried up, and you know we can uh, we can do numbers on that one easily. So back and forth on that. You know, we don't get each other. I know you said that was the last one, but mm -hmm. there aren't that many people percent in San Antonio that use the commissary. They're not taking a lot of business away from H E B. Well, the question was: Is would the, would, the, would the people that are living there come off if they didn't have all the services on base? And would all these 12,000 new people, I think they would. Okay. Would those 12,000 new people, like, hopefully use services yes. off base if they didn't provide them on You're base? You're talking about such a small percentage. You only have somebody look that up. 12,000. Well, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>